to be or not to be? Well, for me, there's really no question about it. I be in a big way. I've got 10 hives of two species of native stingless bee in my garden. 12 years ago, I took an apiarist course with the aim of using European honeybees to assist in pollinating my crops. However, I suffered the outrageous fortune of losing all my bees twice to disease in rapid succession. So I moved to plan B and I tried the native stingless bees and the plan worked. I have all the pollinators that I need. The only trade-off is in volume. Native stingless bees produce a lot less honey than European ones do. Now, 10 hives may sound a little bit excessive, but when a colony of bees gets overcrowded, it's time to split the hive and make two hives from the original one. I've already done that several times, hence all the hives. How do you tell when the hives are ready to be split? The man with the answer is my friend, entomologist Dr Tim Hurd. He designed the hive system I use. So we're going to use the weight to tell us whether the hive's ready to split. It's 8.2 kilos. The box itself's four and a half, so we deduct that weight. We've got 3.7 kilos of contents, which is great. Anything above three kilos of contents, we can split it. These hives have three parts. The top compartment is designed for easy removal of honey. We'll get to that after we've separated the middle and bottom sections. We'll use this hive tool to pry these sections apart. Break the seal first. Let's see what we've got. We might need to take this knife and just nick this brood, just like that, just to separate the brood from the top and the brood down the bottom there. Can you explain what the brood is? Well, we've got the brood in the middle. That's where they're rearing their young. The queen lays the eggs there, the larvae hatch, feed on the food provided by the workers, grow into pupae and then adults and emerge to join the workforce of the hive. And around the outside of that, we've got the stored food. So typically pollen at the front of the hive. Here's the back of the hive. We've got honey. Look at all this amazing honey here. It's such a fascinating structure. I think I can see some larvae down there. Yes, indeed, Jerry, there are larvae there. There's one right there. And over here, you can see a pupa, the next developmental stage. As you know, you've got two species here in your garden, and this is clearly a carbonaria. And we can see that by the flat sheets of comb. See how each of these cells is at the same height? That's typical of carbonaria. So let's split these hives. Here's the empty box that we're going to use. So we'll take these two sections off here to reveal the bottom box. So those two sections have got to be placed down on that bottom. Okay. Perfect. These two, the middle section and the top section can be placed on this bottom section. We'll check that it's not going to snag on any structures in the bottom box, mm -hmm. which it appears it will not. So let's just place that down there like that. Beautiful, it's come together very nicely. And it's simply a matter of placing this top section, the honey super, on there. And basically our split is complete. Wow. The two new hives are now held together with a strap. The hive with a new bottom is vulnerable to pests. By making the entry hole small with propolis, a mixture of wax and resin, Tim is making it harder for the baddies to get in. The bees will remove the propolis when the hive is strong again. So we have two hives, but only one queen bee. That's right. One of these hives will be queenless. There are virgin queens constantly being produced. One of those will take over as the new queen, just to leave the hive on a nuptial flight, mate with a male from another hive, come back and take over as the new queen. They're rather glad they're homes back, aren't they? Absolutely. We're going to split another hive, but this one is a different species. It's Tetragonula hocking's eye. It's found primarily in the Northern Territory and Queensland. So there's the advancing front. Now, what's Jerry? that? 
That's the part of the brood chamber where they're building new cells. So those uh, open cells, that's the ones that have yet to have leg eggs laid in them? Exactly right. That's the current batch of cells under construction. They'll get provision with food and an egg will be laid in those. Then they'll be immediately closed and the whole process will start over again. And you can see how the cells here are not in those same flat sheets that the Carbonaria were. Is that the queen? It is indeed. There she is. That's the first yeah, queen I've ever seen. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations. Now we're going to harvest some honey from one of the other hives by removing the top section, which is also called a honey super. Lovely. Super, full of honey. Just get you to hold that there while I scrape this honey into the container. We're getting a bit of propolis here too. You're just taking the weight up for me there. Next, we're going to use a bed of nails to pierce these honey pots to allow the honey to release and pour out. And how long do you leave that for? About 10 minutes, long enough for the honey to all drain out. We strain the honey through a sieve to remove that debris. Sadly, you can only harvest honey in warm climates. Anywhere cooler than coastal Queensland and the northern rivers of New South Wales, the native bees need all their honey to survive cold spells. So there's a few bees here in this honey, but we can revive those just by giving them a little rinse in water and washing them off and they'll come to life. So how much honey have we got from that? Well, we've got over 750 mils, about 800 mils, which is over a kilo of honey. It's quite runny, isn't it? It is a runny honey. That's typical of these stingless bees. And there's a distinct tang in the flavour. Yeah, it's got a real acidic bite to it, which I think really nicely balances the sweetness. Mm -hmm. 